Okay, we're going to get started. Everybody take their seats. Thank you. Um, welcome to everybody. I'm glad you're coming to this session for the last session of this conference. I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it's been working on this project um, with uh, the Peterson Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the opportunity I've had to meet so many people, a lot of you sitting in the audience, people I haven't known, uh, and to think about these really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to start with a little pitch for something that we have that's related. So I first met Susan Tanaka when she was funding a project of ours called The Fiscal Ship, which is actually a budget game um, in which the idea is to um, specify your values for government, what you think your government should be doing at the same time as you get the budget um, in 25 years to have a debt to GDP ratio no higher than today's. And this focus on, you know, what your values are for government sort of has been sort of been a theme of, of today. Um, and, and the question of uh, the conference um, has been when we think about the increasing diversity of um, the population, how does that affect what policy choices you would make? So, so I advise, so take everybody take a look at the fiscal ship if you haven't seen it before because it's, it's a nice tool. Um, and so that's the end of my plug. Um, so um, today, you know, there there's a ton of issues related to how does the changing diversity affect the way we think about the budgetary challenges that we face for 2050. Um, and to this session is going to be thinking about issues of retirement security and savings. Um, we're only going to touch on a very few of the issues um, that were in the papers uh, that, that were commissioned by Peterson and Ford Foundation. So I encourage you to look on the website to look at all the papers. I'm going to give you a little bit um, of a flavor of what's in some of the papers, except for the ones that Anna Maria and Bill are going to be talking about today. Um, so what's the backdrop for the project? We've heard about, talked about it all day. It's population aging. And I think it's important to remember that aging presents challenges both to the budget, but also to the macroeconomy in general. Um, and so we know that population aging puts pressure on programs like Medicare and Social Security, and so leads to calls for reform of those programs. And so the question is, how should we, do, how should we reform them differently, or what other policies should we have to help make those decisions? Um, so when we think about aging, it comes from two factors. Um, about a third of it comes from increasing life expectancy. Um, and so increasing life expectancy obviously puts pressures on programs like Social Security and Medicare. More people are alive longer, therefore you have to provide them with this annuity, this the benefit they get every year they're alive for more years. It also puts pressure on private savings. People have to, if they're going to, people are going to live longer, um, then they have to figure out how to finance their con consumption in old age. Um, so the other two thirds of population aging comes from past changes in fertility. Um, so the, from the drop off of fertility from about three during the baby boom to something closer to two thereafter. And as we heard um, today, falling um, from two in recent years and unclear whether or not that's going to rebound. Um, so lower fertility means fewer kids per adult. That eventually translates into fewer workers per retiree. And so that also puts pressure on pay-as-you-go programs like Social Security and Medicare. And it's higher, harder to finance any given level of benefits when the workforce is growing more slowly. You know, one thing that's pretty interesting is population aging seems has also been accompanied by a decline in interest rates. And some people believe that the relationship is causal. Um, and so if that's the case, or in any case with interest rates having declined, we not only have pressures on on unfunded programs like Social Security and Medicare, but also funded programs that people thought might have been in good shape, now with lower interest rates look like they're also going to have pressure. And private savers, too, are having um, some kind of uh, difficulty financing your retirement in old age when interest rates are lower. And so whether through in lower interest rates or through sort of just declining uh, growth rate of the workforce, aging is putting pressures on all kinds of elements in society. Okay? So that's the backdrop to the whole conversation that we've had today. Um, the idea is we're, we are eventually going to make policy choices to address these budgetary imbalances. I think it's in, important to remember, as I said, it's, it's a budgetary challenge, but it's also a macroeconomic challenge. So if we change budget issue, if we change policies to like lower benefits, that's just kind of shifting the problem to somebody else. Um, that there is a sort of macro challenge, which means that with an aging society, consumption growth cannot be as fast as it has been in the past, right? And so when we're thinking about um, this discussion today, I just think that's something helpful to keep in mind. Um, so somebody's consumption is going to have to be lower. And, you know, we want to think about who's and how and what other 
other um, accommodations we might make, which include, of course, working longer, which is the, the subject of the, the panel next door. <laughs> so, um, okay, so the other questions we want to ask today is, so what do we know about how well people are prepared for retirement? Um, how will the millennials and Gen Xers, um, who are most likely to be affected by the policy reforms that are being contemplated, right? how will they cope with these cha changes to the programs? Um, how does consideration of increasing diversity affect what kind of choices we want to make? And are there policies we need to be considering to address the challenges now to help people prepare? Um, one big question I think that will come up today is conceptual, uh, which is what does it mean to be prepared for retirement? Right? Should we think about how living standards during retirement compared to your living standards during your working years? That's one way to say, are people prepared? Are they smoothing appropriately across their lifetime? Or we might also just care about whether or not people have a reasonable standard of living, even if it isn't quite as high as it was during working years. We might not care about that relationship. We might just care of you know, how well off are, are the future retirees going to be. Um, you know, another question is, where should the focus be from a policy perspective? Should we care mostly about the bottom of the income distribution to make sure that, you know, the elderly aren't poor or near poor? Um, or should we sort of worry about everyone's saving adequacy? I'm not going to answer any of these questions, by the way. I'm just pu putting them as things that we hopefully will have a discussion about um, today. Um, and then when we think about savings, there's only retirement savings that matter, or also the ability to withstand shocks like an illness or losing a job. Um, and this question about whether or not we care about um, relative adequacy or the level uh, of, of sort of standard of living actually matters quite a bit when we think about, you know, Social Security. So we know that, you know, if we don't make any changes to Social Security, you know, only about three quarter, you know, 75 percent of it of benefits will have funding to be paid. Um, but we also know that Social Security benefits increase over time and they increase with productivity. So that means that in 25 years, even if we made the cuts uh, to benefits, the level of benefits will be as high as today. So it's a, so maybe it will be the wrong choice because relative to the rest of the population, the elderly will be relatively poor, but that's kind of just something that we have to think about, sort of what do we care about, which is more important, and what, where, where does that give? Um, the other thing is, of course, trying to think about the future. You know, this whole idea of 2050 is, you know, we're trying to figure out what it's going to look like, and we know that so many things can change. Um, but, and, and we would try to start making inroads and in thinking about how the changes we are seeing will affect our vision of what things will look like in, in 25 years. So uh, a lot of changes in society. We heard about a lot of them today. Other ones are young people are going to school for longer. They live with their parents for longer. They get married and have kids and buy houses later. They're having fewer kids. Um, they're less likely to get married. All these things are going to impact how well prepared they are for retirement, what kind of lives they have before as well. Um, one of the papers I think Bill will talk about a little bit in his slides uh, in the Peterson Project uses the Urban Institute simulation model to see how some of these factors will sort of flow through and affect um, sort of readiness for retirement. Okay. And, and then the big question of how did the increasing diversity of society matter? Should we assume when we're thinking about this that the patterns that we see now will continue over time, right? So, I mean, one of the approaches that is sort of natural is to say, well, certain, certain families and, you know, blacks do more poorly than whites in many dimensions, and we know that uh, as society gets more diverse, that's kind of a worrisome factor. Of course, we want to get under the bones of it a little bit and say, well, you know, should we assume that these things are going to be the same over time, or should we be thinking about how they might be changing? At the same time, we want to say, well, if we want them to be changing, then what policies should we be pursuing? Um, so another p paper in, that you can look up that was uh, commissioned uh, by Demir Kozik analyzes how returns to college vary by race and gender. So he estimates that the increase in wages that African Americans receive from going to college is much lower than what uh, whites receive from going to college, and that over a working lifetime, black men lose about a million dollars in total earnings due to wage discrimination, and, white w and women, I think, earned a little bit less, lost a little bit less, but also just huge amounts. Um, so you know, he concludes that fighting wage discrimination may be a potent way of increasing living standards, both during the working years and during retirement. And so that kind of brings home the point that when we're thinking about retirement, it's not just about how much people save in terms of whether or not they're ready for retirement, but what kind of earnings that they have in their lifetime, right? So there's two ways to help with retirement security, you know, either increase the saving rate or increase the base on which you're saving. Um, another big question is about income inequality, which we know have increased uh, sharply over the past few decades. And if it's, that's not reversed, that means there'll be sharp differences in living standards of retirees in the future. So the variation will be based on education, 
disability, and geography. And so one of the papers looks at, as Scott Aller points out, uh, people in urban areas have done much better than those in suburban areas. So to the extent that we want to limit inequality in re retirement, we're going to need to address inequality of opportunity during the working years, right? So you can't really think differently about retirement and work op working. Another thing that's really interesting and important, uh, I've done some work on that I was on, on a um, National Academy of, uh, panel of advisors on it, um, which is uh, the growing, widening in inequality in life expectancy. Okay? So it's always been the case uh, here and in every country that rich people live longer than poor people. Um, but what's, what's, what's really um, troubling is how that gap has been widening. Um, with those in the top half of the income distribution experiencing increases in life expectancy, while those in the bottom half stagnating or even falling, right? So Melissa Favreau points out that these gaps in life expectancy aren't just about life expectancy, but they're mirrored in, in health, right? So they're mirrored in gaps in health, with lower income people much more likely to be disabled at any given point in time, and likely to spend a much greater fraction of their years, um, of their re retirement years, in, uh, uh, disabled. So it's not just the income dimension, but it's also, so gonna help the, uh, but also the health dimension, which is a real well-being, another m sort of way of looking at well-being. So these findings are themselves tragic, obviously, and speak to the need for policies to improve living conditions, access to health care, opportunities for those in the bottom of the income distribution. But they also kind of directly affect how you think about re eventual reforms to Social Security and Medicare. Um, so the growing gap in life expectancy by income or education means that on a lifetime basis, Social Security and Medicare are becoming less progressive, right? So these are intended to be prog progressive programs where lower income people get a better return, a better sort of um, uh, benefit relative to their income than higher income people. Um, but it's offset by the fact that higher income there are annuities you get them for so long as you're alive, and so higher income people live longer, and so um, that kind of offsets some of the progressivity. If that gap's widening, that means that these programs are becoming on a lifetime basis less progressive, right? Um, and so that changes the kinds of policies that you might think about. You often hear about pro pro policies to sort of, why don't we index uh, the retirement age to life expectancy? Well, on average, you might think that makes sense. People are living longer. We can't afford to give them this benefit for as long. But if that life, if those life expectancy gains are not distributed fairly across, or you know, uh, across the the distribution, then that has very big redistributional impacts, right? Um, from uh, higher in from lower income people to higher income people. Um, other possible. Um, uh, incentives that we often hear about is what we need to do, since we're going to be living longer, we need to be working longer, right? That's a, a normal way of trying to say, instead of just thinking about, it, you know, how to spread a shrink shrinking pie, but let's make the pie bigger, and so if people work longer, and then we can cut benefits without sort of harming them, right? So uh, so it works in both, it helps the budget because you can cut benefits, uh, you get a little tax revenue, but mostly it's because you can cut benefits, but, you know, it helps people because you can cut benefits, but then they're not, um, they're, sort of well off. Um, but, you know, even in, when you think about um, sort of this uh, diverging health uh, across the income distribution, um, then you really have to be very careful about how you, how you have incentives to stay in the workforce longer. I'm going to quote from the paper, I, from Melissa's paper, because I thought it was so good. Uh, she said, uh, many program changes will likely need to be carefully targeted so that they maintain and even enhance work incentives for those who are able to remain in the workforce, a period that is likely to grow for many, uh, but also maintain protections for those whose disabilities have left them economically vulnerable. And so that's just another dimension of the challenges that we face when thinking about the eventual um, policy um, changes that we need. Okay, so that's my framing of the big pictures. Now we're going to hear a little bit uh, about the work that um, Bill and Anna have done, and then we're going to open it up for hopefully bring a lot of these questions back. So, Bill, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to start by thanking Peterson and Ford. This has been a great uh, set of conferences and research papers, and it's also been one of the most fun things I think I've ever worked on. Uh, last night, I reviewed my talk with my two millennial uh, kids, and uh, a charitable way to interpret their response was I was not paying enough attention to the key role that intergenerational tr transfers would have on their uh, welfare. So uh, with that as caveat, um, let me, let me let me get into this. Uh, so we're looking at uh, uh, how retirement saving will evolve by 2050. Uh, the millennial generation, born in 81 to 96, 
will be between the ages of 54 and 69 by 2050. So asking what happens to retirement saving by 2050 is basically the same thing as asking what happens to saving for the uh, millennials. So that's how we'll focus on it. There's two papers, as Louise mentioned, one by Barbara Buchica at Urban, which I'll talk about at the end of my talk, uh, and one by Jason Fickner, Hillary uh, Gelfond, and, and I. Uh, and what, what Jason, Hillary, and I do is we divide this into two issues. One is how are they doing so far, and then the second one is what can we expect in the coming years. So in terms, in terms of how they're doing so far, this graph shows you data from the survey of consumer finances. It's median wealth for 20 to 35-year-olds uh, in each year from 89 to, or every three years from 89 to 2016. The reason we picked that age group is the millennials were between the ages of 20 and 35 in 2016. So you might not think that wealth at the bottom end of that distribution is that informative. So we also have a 25 to 35 year old category. Uh, but you can see they follow the same patterns, and that is uh, things were going pretty well until 2007, then the Great Recession uh, uh, took a big chunk out of the wealth of the successor generations. Uh, the millennials in 2016 have about one-fourth less median wealth than the generation nine years uh, before them, before the financial crisis. Uh, this is median wealth. Mean wealth falls even more. Uh, for the millennials relative to earlier generations, and that's just picking up the fact that the distribution of wealth is becoming more unequal uh, over time. Uh, so that's, that's bad enough, but in fact, this graph overestimates the relative wealth of the, of the millennials uh, for two reasons. One is that does not have defined benefit pensions in there, and of course, that's fallen over time. And the second is the survey of consumer finances does not survey millennials that live in their parents' home. And there is other evidence that the share of millennials that live in their parents' home is higher than for earlier generations. And you could argue, well, maybe they're saving a lot of money and they're building up their wealth. I think uh, casual observation as well as formal analysis tells you that's not the case. The ones that are living at home are the ones that have less wealth and, and less income. So, so uh, if anything, this graph overstates the relative um, uh, wealth patterns of the millennials relative to earlier generations. Uh, then in terms of what, what should we expect, we divided this up into two ways, uh, two things. One of the, the, one of the dominant features of the millennials is that there's a much higher minority representation in the millennials than in earlier generations. So uh, as we know from this conference, by 2050, the U.S. will be a majority m minority country. Uh, and the, mil the millennials are a big part of that. 44% of them uh, identify as minorities compared to only 25% for a similar age group in the, in the mid-1980s. So uh, there's a big minority representation, and that's important because there's a big literature that says that minorities accumulate less wealth than whites, uh, even after controlling for the usual suspects, age, income, education, marital status, uh, uh, so on. And uh, we run those regressions as well in our paper. Uh, there's nothing particularly incredible or novel about these regressions, except we use 2016 data, whereas other places had only gone to 2013, uh, but this is the coefficient on an indicator variable for a household being African American, and these are individual cross sections in each year. And I should mention these are OLS regressions. If you do a median regression, the numbers are about a third as big. So the 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 125,000 in difference in mean wealth is about 42,000 in. Uh, uh, Median wealth, but anyway, the the thing is, the effect is significant. It's big, and I was surprised to see that it's growing over time. And it turns out there's a fair amount of literature that's consistent with that. Not all of it, but a fair amount of literature is consistent with the ideas growing over time. And I can only interpret this as bad news. Uh, if you believe that racial and ethnic inequities in society have declined over time, 
then the bad news is that the change is not showing up in the wealth data, right? So it hasn't extended that far. If you don't think racial and eth ethnic inequities in society have declined over time, then that's the bad news in itself. Uh, but either way, it suggests that the high, high minority representation uh, in the uh, millennial generation will, will push downward the likelihood that they will be saving adequately uh, for retirement. Um, so that was a little troubling. Then, there, then the, the, the other way to look at what can we expect uh, is basically a list of a whole bunch of factors that vary between the millennials and other generations. And it's education, the shift in pension plans, uh, what I call bad timing, which I'll come back to. Uh, this, the, the more I think about it, the more I think bad timing is really important, uh, sort of timing is everything kind of comment. And then adverse changes in the life cycle. And it's hard to keep these lists uh, straight. And since it's March, I tried to put them in a more familiar form, okay? So in the education region, uh, you have two things going on. The millennials have more education, more college educational attainment than any prior generation. That means higher wages. It may well mean a higher saving rate, right? And it certainly means they will work longer. You know, white collar jobs are less physically taxing. So that's, a, that's two good things. So that bracket looks good. Uh, the 401k bracket is a, meant to indicate the shift from defined benefit to defined contribution plans. Uh, that's good news for retirement saving in that 401ks don't have the early retirement incentive that DB plans do. And so, so rather than saying longer careers, I just said less early retirement. There's a big literature on DB plans kind of implicitly forcing people out because it just doesn't pay to work anymore. That's not true in DC plans, so people will work longer. The downside of the 401k world is people have to do it themselves. They have to decide to sign up. They have to decide how much to contribute. They have to decide where to put it. Uh, they have to decide when to take it out. They have to decide how to take it out. Those are, those are tough choices. Now, the automatic revolution has helped in that regard, but, but not completely, and it doesn't help the 50% of the population of the workforce that's not, that's not covered. So the 401k shift is kind of a, a, a mixed news. Uh, let's go to the life cycle um, issue next. The, the, as Louise mentioned, uh, well, we all know that, that millennials have more student debt. That's the flip side of more education. But that puts them behind the eight ball a little bit. You can imagine people not wanting to start saving for retirement until they paid off their student loans. Likewise, you can imagine people not wanting to start saving for retirement uh, until they've married, until they've had kids, until they bought a house. Uh, millennials are doing all those things at a later and later age, which sh uh, cuts down uh, the amount of time uh, they have to save for retirement if they're doing it in a, in a lexicographic uh, fashion. Uh, if, if they're 25 and saying, I'm going to contribute to my retirement plan, even though I'm, I'm not married yet, I know I'm going to have kids, I know I want to save for a house, and I know I need to pay off my student loan, that would be great news, but that would be quite an exceptional uh, uh, situation. So the, the life cycle at the early end is bad news for, for them, and then the life cycle at the later end is also bad news for them. Uh, now, only economists would say living longer is bad news. We all want to live longer, and obviously it's, it's a good thing. But if you're trying to save for retirement, the longer your retirement period is, the harder it is to accumulate enough wealth uh, to maintain your living standards. So uh, life cycle factors are hitting the millennials fairly strongly. And the last issue is timing. And I, I've only really begun to think of this. So let me just, just say, if you were going to talk to the ultimate social planner about, about designing your life in a way that would make your economic mission easy, you would not say, make me born in a year so that the year I come into the job market, we've got the worst economy in 70 years and a financial crisis. You would not say, as I enter my earning years and start saving for retirement, keep interest rates at historic lows. All right? You would not say, as I get into middle age and like retirement, uh, raise my taxes and cut my Social Security and Medicare benefits because of the fiscal gap. So in some sense, the millennials just are just born at the wrong time. 
and, and they're going to face these headwinds throughout their life cycle. Uh, and then the other, that's from a macro perspective. From a micro perspective, a uh, uh, labor market perspective, you would not say the ultimate, to the ultimate social planner, uh, kick me out of my conventional job and give me a job with no security and no health and retirement benefits and a contingent workforce. And you wouldn't say, give my job to a robot uh, with a, a AI. So there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot of headwinds on this side of the the bracket, um, and uh, how, how this will play out, uh, I don't know. But, but these are the things I'm thinking about in terms of millennials saving for retirement, and this is a perfect feed-in to the other paper, because what Barbara Bruchica does is build all these things into the Dynasim model that, that Urban Institute uses. And she basically gets three results. First, uh, millennials and Gen X will have higher lifetime earnings than earlier generations. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is there's increased inequality. The relative poverty, this, this is the relative poverty rate, so it's people with income, I think, less than a quarter of the, the median, uh, will be higher for the millennials and the Gen Xers. And the replacement rates, the share of the population with replacement rates less than three quarters of their income will go down for the millennials uh, relative to other generations. So what her paper does is very nicely build in assumptions about all these issues that I just showed on that earlier uh, chart. And you can argue about whether the assumptions are right, but, but putting them together in a model and quantifying them uh, is obviously an, an important step. So uh, with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, actually to um, talk about financial fragility in America. And I'm very, very grateful for the support uh, for this project because it's actually a long-term project, but this, uh, this uh, new work has allowed us to actually zoom in and look in particular, in particular at a specific group in the US um, and be able to learn more about this uh, topic. Um, so, um, I know we are talking a lot about kind of financial security, and the idea of financial security is very much connected with planning for retirement, security in the long term, and so on. I want to talk in, at this time not just about financial security in the long term, but financial security in the short term. So actually I want to talk about the ability of people to face a shock. Um, and that's actually important because, um, you know, it's that, I think, also capacity to deal with the uncertainty of life which create the financial security. Um, and that's why I think we also need to bring the attention to um, that, that, that time of short term. I think we were reminded of this just at the beginning of the year with the government shutdown. We actually saw that even employ, employees with a secure job, in a sense, uh, were not able to put food on the table, you know, the week after the shutdown. So I think this bringing a little bit more the attention from the long term, I think, to the short term can be particularly important. And the question I want to ask today is, how can we build a more resilient society? Uh, resilient in terms of security in the long term, but also security in the short term. This is actually a hard question uh, to ask because, you know, I don't think we had in the survey so far a good measure of what we call financial fragility. But back uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, I was visiting Harvard Business School, and together with Peter Tufano, we actually have been able to um, insert in a new survey a question that we actually have called financial fragility. I'm going to tell you what's the wording of the question specifically, and just to tell you why it is a measure of financial fragility or why it, uh, it, it is able to give us, in a sense, that important information that we might want to use to assess for example, that resilience of society. The question is how confident people are to come up with $2,000 if an unexpected need arose within the next month. And they, you can answer this question in four ways, which is I'm certain I can come up, I could probably come up, I would, could probably not come up, and I'm certain I could not come up with $2,000. 
what are the three features of this question that I'm not asking whether people have assets or um, if they have money in the banks, but I'm uh, in fact asking about their confidence to come up, uh, which also means that you know, people could resource to all kind of opportunities. And I think it's that ability, that ingenuity of uh, coming up with resources that's important. The $2,000 is a mid-sized shock. And the 30 days is that you have that horizon, in a sense, to come up with the, uh, with the $2,000. Why is this important? Because it is a measure not just of asset, but also of how indebted people are. Um, and that's why it is a very encompassing measure. Like alone, we, we can think of the confidence, that's actually what matters to people. We can think of their balance sheet just with one question. So without asking that and without asking the level of that or the level of asset, we can actually figure out, in a sense, whether people are able to deal with the shock. Um, this question was asked in 2009 and we were able to add it in the National Financial Capability Study since 2012, and we have used the data in 2015. So now we have an idea, for example, not just how financially fragile people are, but how that fragility has changed over time. So many years after the Great Depression, after the Great Recession, um, how many, you know, what, what has happened to the US? And I think we have two statistics which is important to look at. In 2009, how many people you think were financially fragile? How many people couldn't come up with the $2,000 in 30 days? In the US, it was 50%. Um, back in 2000, and now uh, go to 2015, um, even several years after the financial crisis, 34% uh, of people could not come up with $2,000 in 30 days. So, you know, in a sense, the economy has recovered, but not so much to, uh, to for not so many people being uh, uh, hurt. Uh, can we now show it? Great. So actually, let me perhaps uh, ask these questions. I would just want you to read kind of the question as it is, and it is as it is formulated. Um, and as I've mentioned, it is a measure of uh, both asset, lack of asset, but also of highly leveraged households. So with one question, you get the state of the balance sheet. So let me um, just show you this graph, which I think is uh, kind of really showing, in a sense, how we are improving in that sense, but we are not proving fast enough or that a large segment of the population is financially fragile. The most important one, and coming back to also to the presentation of Bill, in fact, if you look at the millennial, as many as 43% are financially fragile. If you look at women, 42% um, actually are financially fragile. So this average really hides very large differences among the population. Uh, in this project, and we are very grateful to be able to actually focus on what we call the middle income. In fact, even if you look at the income 50 to 75,000, so you think that financial fragility is just high in that lower part of the population. In fact, as many as 28% of that almost upper income group is actually financially fragile. So it's amazing how that fragility really affect a large segment of society and how, in a sense, people are hurting not having that capacity to come up uh, with $2,000. Um, in the paper, we actually show what are some of the contributing factors. Uh, children certainly play a big role, and I think it is reflecting some of, for example, um, uh, trends, for example, cost of education, cost of housing, um, and I think it's actually quite striking how, how uh, present and how important, for example, these, uh, uh, the children and demographics are. Uh, the debt and the debt burden are very, and a very important feature, for example, of this group. And I think we have to think really a lot about the fact that the borrowing opportunity have really changed over time. And by the way, we are back to the situation of the pre-financial crisis in terms of debt. 
And that is very important when we look, for example, at the financial fragility. As I mentioned, financial fragility often means that people are, are already so much leveraged and are already so much in debt that facing a shock would actually imply either adding on that debt or not or already have been maxed out on the debt. And so if you look at the balance sheet, for example, of this population, the striking feature is already how much debt they carry. And the other important feature, uh, as you know, uh, we do a lot of work on financial fragility and I, uh, financial literacy, and I want to mention this again, uh, going back also to the talk of Bill, which says, you know, the millennials, for example, are lucky because they have a high income and a high education. When we look at this group, um, even though if you look at the millennial, they have high education, but um, unfortunately they have this low financial literacy. And when you look at the people who are financially fragile, in particular, one of the striking features is also their low level of financial literacy. And the idea is, again, that today, in this world, you need not only the resources, but also the capacity to manage those, your resources, in particular when you are facing this opportunity to borrow, when you are facing this much more complex financial market, when you are facing this individual responsibility to save for retirement, but also to set yourself up in a in a sense, in a more financially secure situation, it's really striking the low level of financial literacy, even of people which have already made a lot of financial decisions. So it doesn't seem that you learn necessarily by watching the world around you. Um, so in addition to do actually the, this quantitative work, we have done a lot of qualitative work. So we have been able to, for example, do focus group in several cities. And we have done actually some focus group ourselves. We were part of, for example, this project of FINRA, where we actually went around Washington, D.C., asking this question. And I'm going to give you this picture because, you know, it's like, you know, you don't think potentially this person as, you know, being financially fragile, but the people who are financially fragile are so pervasive that they really are, they look like us. So don't think of the financially fragile as the lower income, lower educations. They are actually the solid middle class. We also had this project that we did during Financial Literacy Month uh, um, um, a year ago where we asked if your wallet could talk, what would that say? And I think what we have learned in all of this focus group is how much this, in a sense, incapacity to deal with the shock is hurting uh, the U.S. And this is really, in a sense, the message I would like to leave, which is, you know, uh, this, this incapacity, this lack of capacity to deal with a shock is very consequential. Uh, it is here and is now, and it hurts. Um, so there are lots of implications for policy, um, including uh, the attention, I think, to uh, not just the saving for retirement, but the short term and implication for research. Uh, by the way, we show that uh, this uh, financial fragility is strongly related to planning for the future. So it is, in a sense, related to also the capacity to save for the future. For, it has implication for pension designs. And I would like to actually take some more of the questions. We have actually done quite a bit of work. But I want to leave you with the last picture um, uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you know, life is unexpected. And by the way, this picture itself was stolen. Just to say how life is tragic, you know, the, the picture of a storm even is stolen. But it is a Rembrandt because we, and I, the reason why I put it up is because um, we actually presented this work uh, in, in Amsterdam uh, at this conference in front of the Queen of the Netherlands. So uh, we actually talk about financial fragility with her, and she's very passionate actually about financial literacy. And uh, as a result of also that conference, we now have these questions in the, uh, the Dutch Central Bank panel. So we are able now to compare this data across countries, and we would like to who actually have a, a, a very robust discussion. We, uh, there were a lot of central bankers there, and we thought that you know, as we do this stress test for banks, maybe it's time to do stress tests for household as well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna open up. We lost a little time with the, the uh, slides, uh, but let's, we have time for questions, so we open it up. Uh, Tell us who you are, where you're from. Uh, Josh Gordon with the Concord Coalition. Uh, I guess maybe this is to Bill, but other people can weigh in. Uh, we saw data this morning, and I know anecdotally from asking 
groups that I talked to that uh, millennials uh, don't think they'll re be receiving Social Security. That's pretty kind of universal. Um, they don't think it'll be there, they won't get anything, and I get to tell them that even if we cut benefits to match revenues, they'll get something. Uh, but this idea of not getting Social Security, does it have any effect on their behavior during their working life to save and, um, and, and, and plan for retirement? Because the normal Social Security theory is that it does impact plans to save for retirement, um, but uh, you don't kind of hear those two things squared up. Uh, so, as a matter of logic, if you think Social Security is not going to be there, you should save more. But as a matter of logic, you should think Social Security will be there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't really know. Anybody else? I have questions if you don't have questions. Uh, oh. uh, thank you. Uh, Ashley Edwards, Census Bureau. Um, I had a question for Anna Maria about the um, ability to sort of meet a financial shock. Uh, you talked about people with relatively high earnings or income that had difficulty meeting the $2,000 uh, shock. I'm curious, you know, if you discussed in your paper the inverse, so people that have very low cash income or assets but have really high attachment to family, church communities, um, and how maybe that will change with millennials. Um, so we are not able uh, to, uh, in the new data, which is the National Financial Capability Study, uh, we were not able to look, uh, for example, in detail of what is it that people do and so on, even though we have a relatively set of rich data on other characteristics. But one of the things that we have really learned from the 2009 data, where we added this uh, question on the global, actually, risk survey, and we could ask what people do. We exactly found this dichotomy, actually, which has to do also with minorities. And the reason why we don't ask about asset or debt is we wanted to figure out what is it that people do. And I think there is actually a dichotomy in society between, for example, uh, the uh, African Americans and, uh, um, and, for example, wh white Caucasians, which is that the white Caucasian disproportionately use asset and formal markets, and African American disproportionately use family and friends to deal with the shock. And so, you know, I think it's really important to, in a sense, also take into consideration, you know, not just the kind of the income and the asset, but your capacity, right, to, in a sense, deal uh, in, in that, deal with the shock. And that capacity also involve your networks. Um, and, and, I, and I think it also speaks of the ingenuity, in a sense, of people to, to actually do so. So that's why we have learned so much, and we have also learned so much from the focus group. I think, you know, often, in particular in the lower income people, we also see that reliance very much kind of on the asset. The other thing that I've, I was really shocked, in a sense, from the, from the focus group, even though we, we talk so much about managing asset, when people face a shock, the first thing they think about is how to increase their income. So they, they often do not think of asset, actually, or do not, do not think of, you know, of actually preparing or having the asset, but they think if something happens, you know, can I just work you know, more or can I just you know, take up some work somewhere? And potentially it might also be because there is, in a, there is a much more um, easier market as well, or a labor market or capacity to do so. We had a lot of, for example, uh, Lyft and Uber driver, and that's actually what they told us. Perhaps the gig economy might contribute to that, but my question is always, what about savings? Josh Gottbaum, Brookings. Talk about policy. Talk about what if the Congress of the United States were not the messed up organization that we heard at lunch, um, or somehow they listened to you all, what would you do to increase savings? Would you change Social Security and raise FICA? Would you have mandatory private savings, et cetera? What would you do to increase financial resiliency, et cetera? I mean, yeah. Just give us some sense of things that people might espouse to deal with these issues? Uh, so for me, the, the first order thing would be uh, getting everyone into an automatic something. 
So if they're in a DB, fine. If they're in a 401k, you know, if their employer offers a 401k, make an automatic. If they're not covered, have an automatic IRA uh, program. Uh, that seems like the big first step. Once you do that, then you have to have, you know, investment fund allocations. But I feel like that can that's a second second order issue. Uh, I want to distinguish, though, between uh, I, I thought one of the interesting things that Anna Maria said was that even people who have made financial decisions are uh, don't have the the yeah and and. Uh, so there's a separate issue from like raising savings versus teaching people about what to do about it, which seems very challenging because uh, you have to step out of the standard economics domain. So I would do actually three things connected with this. You know, the automatic enrollment is important, but we need to consider also the short term. And I think you know there can be some. Uh, potential issues or taking away necessarily an important liquidity to workers just by automatically enrolling people. So I think, you know, we need to move beyond this simple automatic enrollment and I think can reach that debate. Um, the second thing is I, I'm, I'm really also thinking at the employer now there are all of these financial wellness program and I think financial wellness should incorporate and often it incorporates this attention also to the precautionary saving which seems very, very important. And the third, I would actually uh, make uh, financial education mandatory mandatory in the schools. I think, you know, the, the future, what the future brings to us is uh, a lot of uh, complex decision, um, a lot of the uh, importance of managing our own resources, and, and I think prevention is much better than paying the cost for that. And uh, I would actually start as early as possible, um, um, so, you know, because that's actually how we learn every other topic, but I, since uh, this is actually my sixth year that I teach personal finance at GW, it can actually be taught in a um, traditional way, uh, personal, you know, we teach corporate finance, and so it's very interesting that when we think that people manage money for the firms, they need to know finance. But when people manage money for themselves, everything goes. You know, we don't even care about how much they know, even though they are managing now their pension. So I really kind of beg you to pay attention to this. And, and actually, the students are very enthusiastic and interested in this topic, if not because they have to manage their own student loan. But because, like you, I'm a little bit uh, afraid that the government won't really pick up on this. We just launched this very week on Monday, Fastlane, which is a one-stop resource for everybody who is interested in promoting financial education in school. You know, if you are a teacher, if you are a parent, if you are a uh, community leader, um, if you are a school administrator, we actually have resources for you to take down the barrier to have financial education in the school. It's, it's important, it is urgent, we cannot wait any longer not to, have, not to equip the young generation for the new economic environment they are facing. Hi, I'm Mark Mother with PRB. And I guess this is a question for you, Bill. Um, there's trillions of dollars wrapped up in the U.S. housing market. Uh, all of these baby boomers are going to be downsizing at some point, mostly white baby boomers. And then you're describing these headwinds for millennials. Uh, home ownership rate for African Americans is down. Uh, younger adults, the home ownership rate is way down. So it seems like there's this mismatch. Is that? And, and I know Dow Myers, and he's here at the conference. I know he's addressed, he's asked this question about whether this is going to create, uh, you know, are baby boomers going to be able to actually uh, see the profits that they expected, all these uh, these huge increases they've seen in their home values? Is that a cause for concern? Is that something you've looked at at all? You mean for the boomers or for the millennials? Yeah, obviously there's issues for millennials in terms of the headwinds win they're facing, but it, it seems like baby boomers need to be paying attention too because. Um, it's not clear that they're going to be able to um, sell their homes when they when they start to downsize, given what's happening with the younger generation. That's interesting. Uh, the the I think there's a well. First of all, the the so the baby boomers are already moving into retirement. The leading edge of the baby boom is now what seventy five, I think, born in 1946. So. Uh, they're sort of straddling. They're kind of right where the mo millennials will be in 2050, I guess. Uh, uh, housing wealth seems to be part of the psyche 
of the baby boom generation. And uh, uh, I don't think people are extracting housing wealth for retirement purposes that much right now. I mean, there are these products, but uh, they're expensive, they're clunky to use, uh, they're not, you know, they're not wholesale operations, they're very retail. Uh, and so uh, there is this big impending transfer of housing, I guess, from boomers to millennials. And there's a question of whether uh, the changing demographics will support uh, the higher housing values. I think that, so that's going to be critical both for the boomers uh, trying to finance their extended retirements uh, and the millennials who have you mentioned, but I think I mentioned this, they have a lower home ownership rate given at their given age than earlier generations. So uh, that's definitely one of the big moving, fac moving parts that will influence all of this. I'm just going to, before we get to the next question, I just want to add something to that. So when I was in graduate school, Greg Mankiw and David Weil wrote a paper about how demographic change was, was going to decimate housing values. Uh, and they thought sort of markets were forward looking. And so they were predicting that it would uh, decimate housing values just as the housing boom took off. Um, but, 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 you know, the, the question is how forward looking, you know, should, the, should people be, you know, is it still something that's going to happen? And on the other question, I read a paper with David Weil also a long time ago. Uh, there's a question about whether or not people do use their housing. Uh, as a stock of wealth, and you know, there's this idea that they don't want to downsize, they don't move. But we did find that when people get sick, when a spouse dies, sort of, they don't. So it's not sort of like, oh, I'm retired, I'm now going to downsize. But when when something happens and they don't have the resources, that is something that that they then turn to, uh, and they do downsize and they do change. So it's it's a really we'll we'll see. <laughs> yeah, over here. Uh, Jeff Selberg, P uh, Peterson Center on Healthcare. I'm curious about healthcare costs, uh, especially about long-term care. Uh, and aging and long-term care costs, I think, exceed even uh, the middle class's capability uh, to pay for it. Medicaid is the, the safety net. There are situations now where people spend down their assets to become Medicaid eligible. I'm curious what you think uh, the answers are as the population ages and there's a greater need for this kind of care. Uh, I'll take a crack at that, but you guys definitely jump in. Uh, uh, the problem with long-term care insurance is that it's really expensive. It's not a good product, and I say that from having looked at the market myself from the uh, from my mother. Uh, and uh, I I don't know what to do about it. I mean, healthcare is expensive, and and the the very kind of hands-on nature of long-term care, the labor-intensive nature of it, uh, it just, uh, I mean, there's, I don't know that there's a way to economize on that. Uh, and so that seems like another one of the big uncertain moving, moving parts going forward. Just briefly, I wanted to say, you know, this is this is just so important. I think we need to consider like how people, for example, insure, and not just about like the long-term care, but just even now, now how they insure about their health care. Because now we have this high deductible, and we have the HSA, and I think, you know, when we look at some of the decisions that even people make now, you know, it's not very obvious that they are making, for example, the best decision. So people go for this high deductible, but in fact, they don't have actually the precautionary saving. So they are really insuring for like the, in a sense, catastrophic event, but in fact, you know, they are not able to go to the doctor. And we have seen, and we have documented uh, in several papers that the one who don't have the liquidity don't do so. So I think that, you know, that's another important part in a sense of, of what people do. Very interestingly, by the way, we actually see that the people who are financially fragile, they get the their liquidity by actually not paying their medical bills. You know, so, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, it's not just the long-term care, but it's just even the shock, the, the bill that happens now that seems to be affecting, let alone this very important and, you know, big problem down the road. And, and let me just add, too, so there's some papers that, are that were commissioned as part of this thinking about the nexus between immigration and long-term care. So who are the caregivers going to be? And, and when we think about our immigration policy, to take that into account. Um, so just information. Uh, Jean. I wonder if, if the three of you, as well as some of the comments in the audience, like on housing, aren't coming to a general conclusion, which is 
at the bottom of the income distribution, we need to worry about setting up some minimum safety net, probably stronger than what we have now. But from, say, lower middle, or at least certainly middle income classes and above, is it a conclusion that we really need to be working a lot more on the private wealth side than on the public wealth side? So we've gone through about 80 years where the primary social welfare policy in the United States is, has been to put more and more money into elderly support. And in fact, now all the growth, all the growth in real spending by government is destined to go for health and, and social security. And interest of the debt because we don't collect enough taxes. Uh, and we have this problem on the other side of the wealth. And I just want to add a two or three facts to add, to add to why I come to this conclusion. One of which goes early to what you said, Louise, about, about, about some of the losers at the bottom where we need to worry about it. But in fact, giving people more and more years of retirement has not been a progressive policy. So we've done analysis of it. It's basically proportional. The reason it's proportional because the mortality effect is offset by the fact that a large portion of low-income people get on disability before they ever get to retirement. So it's proportional. So my calculation is for my wife and myself, the seven additional years of retirement we get is worth, counting on the Medicare, is worth about four or $500,000 in lifetime benefits. It's pretty regressive. In spending policy, where you often measure regressivity and progressivity by absolute benefits, you would never say that our kids should get educational benefits that are proportional to our income, and the low-income people should get educational benefits proportional to their income. We call that extremely regressive, yet for some reason, this massive benefit increase for middle and upper-income people has, has been accepted as, as just something we have to do for, for Social Security. The second thing that affects this progressivity element is because the system is designed, particularly if you count it to work count where the money's coming from, it's designed so that the younger generations are going to get lower and lower benefits relative to taxes. Because we've had all these windfall subsidies we still haven't built out of the system. Now they're a little more in Medicare than Social Security. So what that means demographically is that the losing generations are going to be predominantly black and Hispanic, and the winning generation is going to be predominantly white. And quite bluntly, liberals don't want to admit that, so uh, they don't want to deal with that, that side of the issue. And then finally, there's this issue which I think Anne Marie gets to, which is, seems to me that the private wealth issue is different than the consumption public plus private wealth. That private wealth gives you option value, it gives you power, it gives you the ability to meet emergencies. That's different from just saying, I've got some backup system that's going to make sure I get adequate consumption. It's also saying I have all these other benefits. And so I, so I, I look at all this and conclude that, that the conclusion is we need to work a lot more on figuring out how to, to get lower to moderate income to middle income people much more private wealth holdings and do a little less on giving them more and more uh, of, of this public wealth system. I just want to agree with that. I, I actually um, agree. I mean, your analysis is really brilliant and uh, I, um, I just want, want to add that I really do think we need to equip people in a sense to like deal with that and you know have more capacity to for example build the wealth because um, it's going to be very expensive uh, to probably deal otherwise and in often in many cases I think you know we've seen the example of so many crises where the result has been more support to like uh, in a sense that people are already better off. So, um, in, you know, I, I really do think we need to pay more attention to that private wealth part, and we can do it in a way that is still kind of sustainable and in a way that, you know, you know we, we can make a more resilient society. Yeah, I'm all, so when I think about private wealth and sort of this ability to, I mean, so you have two possibilities. You can self-insure or you can have social insurance. Right, and you're saying we should have more self-insurance. Um, and the other, other option is to have the same amount of savings, but like to do things to increase opportunities, then that sort of serves both. So I'm not sure when you think about private wealth for the lower income that, the, that, that they should be sort of consuming less and saving more. I'm not sure that's to me, sounds like the right, um, you know, I'm, I'm much more into investing in them and uh, increasing opportunity and increasing social insurance. Um, you know, I was gonna ask you, so, when we think about something like two thousand dollars, and I would, um, is that? And then I think about what I should really be worried about with financial fragility. Is it the little two thousand? And maybe it is the little shocks that really set people off on a really bad path, and that if they just could take those sort of relatively little shocks, they'd be much better off. Or are the big shocks things that there's no way they're going to be able to self-insure for anyhow? So right. No, but to me, the the that is what it's a proxy, is an indicator in a sense, you know, of how well the economy is doing. Right. That uh, in fact, often you can't 
you know, you actually cannot deal uh, with those uh, situations. And it is very linked, actually, to the retirement planning. So it's not that, you know, there is a little shock and you cannot deal with this well, you know. Well, fine, because in any, you know, what we need to worry about is your planning for retirement. Uh, in fact, the fact that you know, people are so, in a sense, fragile, I think, has a set of consequences, including that the fact they're not therefore planning for the future. Uh, you know, right? you know, and you can give all the tax incentive you want, but probably they're not going to do so. Um, and that people cannot show up at work, and that people are giving up on uh, health care, and so on. And I think this has important consequences. And so we need to think in a more holistic way when we are thinking, I, uh, I think, of uh, uh, financial resilience. Um, and, you know, and people also, by the way, go bankrupt and, you know, uh, pile up on debt as well. So there are really serious consequences, and we need to pay attention to that short term as well. Okay, we're going to have to end it there. Um, thank you. Please join me in thanking our panel. Um, and remember, we're, we're requested to all go back into the big room so that we can have this wrap-up session um, instead of the break, I think. So thank you very much. <laughs>